The views and opinions expressed on this program are those of the participants and do not reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. BronxNet. Your voice, your views, your vision. And hey, good morning and welcome to Open. I'm your host, Darren Hyman. Of course, you're watching the one and only interactive talk show bringing the best of the Bronx and the world right to you. First up, it is one of the biggest stories to touch our area. With Hurricane Sandy over two weeks behind us, many are still feeling the effects of the storm left on the community. Parks and playgrounds throughout New York City have been damaged and shut down. We'll hear from an organization looking to restore Van Cortlandt Park right here in our borough. And a normal number of organizations are still affected as a result of the storm. We'll also tell you it take you to one organization that is no longer able to run from their base at the docks at Hunts Point. And then many New Yorkers are unsatisfied with the MTA's performance in the aftermath of the hurricane. We'll talk to an organization looking to make people's voices heard. Plus, with Thanksgiving approaching, we cannot forget those in need right here in our own community. We'll find out what one local church is doing to ensure all Bronxites have a place to go with a hot meal. And after that, we'll hear an intergenerational story of an inspiring musical journey. And we'll also hear from a business hosting an event for a cure. So stay tuned. All this and much more is heading your way because right now we're officially open. Bronx Tides, I'm your host Darren Jaime. Today is Wednesday, November 13th, and you're watching Open, the only live and interactive program bringing the Bronx and New York straight to your TV set. We want to hear from you, so feel free to send us an email with any of your questions, your comments, or the stories that you have for us. We also want to let you know that you can hit us up on Facebook by searching under Open, Bronx Net Television, and Twitter by following our page at Bronx Net TV. And you can also watch us live from our website at www.bronxnet.org. Well, although there have been great efforts to restore New York City after Hurricane Sandy, many parks and playgrounds around the city are still damaged and remain unopened to the public, including parts of Van Cortlandt Park right here in our borough. Here now to discuss what he's doing to restore Van Cortlandt Park and what others can do to get involved is community member Brad Paisley. We welcome you now to the show. Good to have you, Brad. Nice to meet you. Good. So. As we talk about Hurricane Sandy, obviously a devastating effect. And when we look at the borough of the Bronx, not tremendously as affected as other boroughs, but yet and still a big effect. Van Cortlandt Park, a major place. Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of blown down trees, both in Van Cortlandt Park and all over the Bronx. And I'm the trail restoration crew leader out of Van Cortlandt Park. And our crew's been working really hard to do restoration efforts, both over the Bronx from Hurricane Sandy and right in the park on the trails. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about the trails, how much of the trails are actually affected? Oh, wow. Every single trail across the park has received some sort of damage. Um, it may not seem like there's a lot of trees down in the Bronx, but there's a lot more than you would expect. Mm -hmm. In Van Cortland, uh, one of the most major trails, the cross country running trail, mm -hmm. completely blocked off. Like we had to cancel races the first weekend after the storm because there were so many trees blown down. But we've been working around the clock trying to get all the trails clear. What's the restoration effort been like? Who have you got partnering with you? Yeah, we have quite a few partners. Uh, Elliot Angle was the congressman who was able to get us the funding for this. The Friends of Van Cortland Park were the ones who wrote the grant to get a trail restoration crew in the park. And we work with New York City Parks. We are New York City Parks workers. Mm -hmm. So those are our partners there. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about trail restoration, how is trail restoration actually coming about? How, what, are you guys, what are you guys doing? Sure. Well, we do, let's say, three major things. Thing number one would be clearing the brush mm -hmm. and deadfalls from the trail. So Hurricane Sandy, of course, create a lot more windblown trees. We've been working really hard to get those clear. The other main thing that we do is make sure that water can get off the trail. Erosion, you know, water washing away the soil on the trail is a major problem. Many of our trails are actually dirt surfaces or a surface called stone dust, mm -hmm. you know, 
So we're working to divert water. So if you ever go on the cross country trail, you might see these railroad ties, you know, every so many feet. Mm -hmm. And those are actually made to divert water. They're not just an obstacle to, you know, trip you up. So, so right now, how's the progress working out so far? Because it's only, a, you know, we're only a few weeks out, but yet and still, there's still a lot of work still needs to be done. Related to Hurricane Sandy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, we've gotten a lot done. The uh, northwest forest section of the park is more or less clear of deadfalls. Okay. The cross-country trail is completely open and racing resumed this past weekend, actually. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the greater Bronx, about half of our crew has been working with the Bronx Division of Forestry, going out and clearing roads, sidewalks, clearing down trees that fell on houses. We've done a lot of work right in the Bronx, you know, helping out clean up after the storm. So it's been a really gratifying experience, you know, to, yeah. To, to, get, to, be, to be a part of that. Now, can the public still play a part in all of this? Yeah, we're always accepting volunteers at Van Cortland Park. You know, uh, we have volunteer events, usually the first in second Saturday of every month. The first Saturday of the month is usually it's in forest restoration, planting, invasive species removal, mm -hmm. and some debris cleanup. Mm -hmm. We also have volunteer events the second weekend of the month, often they're directly helping out the trails. Mm -hmm. So you can look into that on the Van Cortland Park website, the Van Cortland Park Conservancy website, and the Friends of Van Cortland Park website. What would you want people to know about about this whole effort, given the fact that Sandy has had an effect, you guys have really responded to, you know, to what's going on. What would you want people to know these days? Well, I would want them to know that, you know, the parks are working hard. I mean, we've sent people, like I said, all over the Bronx. We had people from my crew working at Cunningham Park, working at Prospect Park, working all over the Bronx. We're doing the best to make the park beautiful and clear of dead falls. And we're doing our best to you know, plant, replant trees mm. and deal with other issues that, you know, were impacted by Hurricane Sandy. During this time of year, what do we say, what do we see event wise? That we see a lot of cross country races. Yep. And in addition to cross country races, what else do we see right, right, right around the parks? Running around the parks. Let's see. We, uh, well, earlier in the year, for example, we had the Philharmonic Orchestra come mm. and play at the park. Mm. We also have a summer concert series, which goes on. We also have they would be uh, interpretive events through the park, uh, urban park rangers. Mm -hmm. So if you go to the Van Cortland Park uh, Nature Center, you can actually sign up to go on, like, say, a bird watching walk. Right. You know what I mean? Because Van Cortland is one of the most forested parks in New York City. I mean, 60% of the park is forest. Mm -hmm. So you can get the opportunity to walk with a ranger who knows about the trees, the animals, the birds, and learn about those sort of things. So we want to tell people, if you want to find out more information, you can make sure that you click onto the website and do your best that you possibly can. As far as helping out, I mean, obviously you guys have got a grant through Elliott Angle to really be able to do that. Uh, what was the feeling like? Were you kind of worried that you were going to have to pretty much do this all on your own without grant? Can you rephrase that? Sure. Once? When you, we got a grant from Elliott Angle to yeah. really help with the, with, the, with the park restoration. So were you a little nervous given the fact that you might not have been able to get hurricane relief and you guys would have been stuck to just do it all by yourself? Well, our grant from Angle, that came in March. Mm -hmm. So we've been working on the trail since March. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So in terms of the hurricane relief, that's like a completely separate deal through FEMA. You know, so it really wasn't much of a concern. Does uh -huh. that answer your question? Right, yeah. Uh -huh. That definitely answers the question. Yeah. So with, for people who want to be more involved, give us the email address and what can they do? Or website? Sure. Uh, I mean, NewYorkCityParks.gov. You know, you can search Van Cortland Park. There's information there. There's also information on the Van Cortland Park Conservancy webpage and the Friends of Ben Cortland Park. That's also a nonprofit organization that runs volunteer events about that. We also have a Facebook page for Van Cortland Forest Restoration mm -hmm. and they run volunteer events pretty regularly. So if people want to get involved and help out, we always love help. So and off the top of your head, what's coming around the corner? Anything anything happening in the, in the near future? Uh, our next volunteer event will be the first weekend of December. Mm -hmm. So that's coming up soon. That's going to be a tree planting, invasive species removal kind of event uh, and around the corner for us I mean we're still cleaning up from Sandy you know we have a lot of trails that we want to get clear and we're going to keep working hard to help out 
the park and the people of the Bronx. Well, Brad, best wishes in trying to make that happen. I know it's a lot of work and a lot of cleanup that goes involved in that, but thank you guys for really working to get that done, and hopefully we can see all the events that we want to have at Van Cortland Park really going full speed. So thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. All righty, Brad Payson here with us, and we want to tell Brad stay here because we're going to take a quick break, and uh, we do have to take a quick break. But coming up next, guess what? We are going to hear from an organization that has been affected by Sandy, and we'll tell you more about them when we return. Don't go anywhere. Nice, Dad. Nice, Dad. Nice, Dad. Charles! Nice, Dad. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of siblings in foster care who take you just as you are. There is also a very attractive extended warranty option that includes free service and parts for the next five years. But there's no need for you to get that. You failed to get the test you needed at the doctor that would have detected disease early enough where it could have been treated. So you won't be around in two years to see him grow up which means the warranty would be useless. Okay, sign here, please. For a list of tests every man should have, go to ahrq.gov. Cook foods to the right temperature using a food thermometer. 3,000 Americans will die from food poisoning this year. Keep your family safer. Check your steps at foodsafety.gov. And yeah, welcome back. Remember, Open is a live and interactive talk show, so you can always join in on the conversation by sending us an email to open at bronxnet.org. Well, Rocking the Boat serves the Bronx community through youth empowerment by teaching students coming from severe economic, educational, and social conditions to shape themselves both personally and professionally by working together to build boats and sails and restore, uh, pardon me, restore local urban waterways. As a result of Hurricane Sandy, they are no longer able to launch their boats from the dock at Hunts Point. Here now to discuss the organization and their restoration efforts is Public Relations Director Chrissy Word. And uh, Chrissy, good to have you. Thanks, Director of Public Programs. Director of Public yes. Programs, I'm sorry, <laughs> Pro Programs. We can the change problem. that up right quick. Give us a little bit about this here. So you guys have been affected by Sandy in a tremendous way. And right now, even today, things are still slow moving. Thankfully, our park wasn't um, uh, severely impacted, I would say. The biggest issue that we had was with our floating dock. Um, the storm surge uh, came up so high that the dock actually floated up and hung on its pilings. Mm -hmm. And so that made it um, a danger, I think, to anybody getting around it. So the park was closed and is still closed as of 5 o'clock yesterday. I'm not sure. I haven't been there today, but um, mm -hmm. hopefully it'll open up again soon. Right. But that does impact us because we do run all of our on-water programs through Hunts Point Riverside Park. And so we have not been able to do that um, you know, regularly. We were given a um, provisional okay to run um, some programs out of Concrete Plant Park, um, which was not considered to be a dangerous area for um, our programs. But being at Concrete 
Plant Park is a little bit more of an inconvenience. Definitely, <laughs> definitely, because it's you know it's a it's a bit of it's not too far, but it is not necessarily a walk. You mm -hmm. know, whereas we can go out our door and right through Hunts Point Riverside Park to get to the river. We can't do that. You know, Concrete Plant Park is about a half a mile away. Mm -hmm. What are the challenges right now that you guys are still facing to be able to move forward? Well, um, thankfully, now that the time has changed, we are able to run, um, you know, a good portion of our programs indoors. And, and that's what we do during the fall anyway. But we do, um, you know, uh, like at this time to be able to get out on water uh, early in the afternoon. And we're not able to do that right now. Um, things like water quality testing that we would normally be doing, we, we can't do those things at this point. Mm -hmm. So still inconvenience. Yeah. For people who are not familiar with the organization, give us a little history. Yeah, so Rocking the Boat um, is about 11 years old, I think, at this point. It was founded by Adam Green. He's the uh, founder and executive director. And um, it was founded as a boat building program, so a, a youth development program in which students um, come in and, and, and build a boat and kind of explore a lot of different things through that activity. Um, after a few years, a bunch of boats were there, and so the organization said, well, what are we going to do with these boats, you know? And so that's how the on-water program grew um, out of that. And I think, you know, the organization really looked at the on-water program as an opportunity to give back, you know? And, and so restoration was the, the first thought. Well, we can use these boats not only to explore and learn about um, our waterways, particularly the Bronx River, but also we can train our students to do restoration activities, to work with scientific partners, and to really get out and help to restore our waterways. Given the fact that you've been inconvenienced in such a major, major way through this hurricane, what's the mood like of your students? Well, you know, last week was a little, everybody was kind of offbeat a little bit, like kids were out of school as well. And so thankfully we were able to open up our program and invite students in to just give them some sense of normalcy. And, and so last week there was this kind of a sweet mood, like, okay, we can't go to school and things are kind of strange, but at least we can go to Rocking the Boat and people love us there. And, you know, we can get some of our work done. Even mm -hmm. though we came to the river right now, we can still be working towards other things. So give us a little bit about your students and where they come from and who and who participates in the program? Well, we work with students from all around the city. Um, our after-school programs are for high school students. Um, the primary boat building and on-water program are for ninth and 10th graders. And then our advanced apprenticeship programs, the environmental job skills, and the boat building programs are for 11th and 12th graders mm -hmm. primarily. So you have an opportunity to learn actually how to make a boat. Yes. Oh, every semester our students build a boat. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And the the job skills boat building apprentices actually not only build boats, but they learn how to restore boats as well. So how long is a boat building process? Because you're talking about building a boat. Well, normally we build uh, what are called uh, traditional white halls, mm -hmm. and the students can build one in about 13 weeks in a semester. Really? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, there's a, so walk us through this. I come to class, if I'm a student, I come to class and I say, okay, I want to take part. I'm learning the apprenticeship program on how to build a boat. Obviously, you've got some people there who can help assist. Oh, sure. And, and so give us, give us a little bit what a student goes sure, through in that class sure. setting. Well, I think that when a student first walks into rocking the boat, it's, it's a really like a, a brand new land. You know, they, they come in and all the tools, there are power tools as well as hand tools and also boats to look at. So, so kids are learning from, from looking at boats that have already been built and they're working with um, our boat building directors, mm -hmm. but also with our youth staff. These are um, young people who have been all the way through our programs and now are hired as staff members to work with our students. And I think the, I think the greatest impact really comes from students working with our youth staff, mm -hmm. you know, because they're peers. Right. And they see that, wow, this person has learned so much you know, in sticking with and committing to something. And, and it's, it's pretty wonderful, wonderful interactions between them. Given the challenges that you're facing right now, where do you go from here and what's, what's the next on the plate? Well, the hope is that Hunts Point Riverside Park will open up uh, mm. really soon uh, and that we can kind of get back to normal. Unfortunately, uh, for my programs, the on-water group programs, I work with high schools and um, nonprofit organizations, corporations. Several of my groups had to cancel this semester, so I'm hoping to put them into the spring. Mm. Uh, and, you know, that that's we, we've taken a bit of a hit there, you know, because the last two weeks we've had almost nothing in terms of those programs. and. 
now we're going to have a few more, but you know, hopefully those groups will just move right into the spring and, and the spring we'll see kind of a, a normal program season again. Well, what does that mean for you guys? I mean, even having to just cancel given the fact of what's going on. What's that well, mean? you know, rocking the boat. Um, this is a, uh, our on-water group programs, our fee for service. We work primarily with the public schools. And so we take a little bit of a financial hit there. Um, but also that it's really the, the difficulties with our groups because most of them had started already and then they had to quit, you know, in the middle of the semester. And so my concern is really for students who started and were really enjoying themselves and, and now that's been interrupted. Mm -hmm. But once again, we'll get them into the spring and we'll get them back on the river and, and learning. Yeah, it's, that, it was, it's really a sad thing that you have to cancel, but then, uh, of course, you have the spring coming around the corner. That's it. If people want to find out more about rocking the boat and be involved and do that, what do they do? There's several opportunities, actually. Our website, of course, rockingtheboat.org, um, has a plethora of information. But if you really want to learn about rocking the boat, uh, we have our end of semester celebration coming up. December 14th at 6 p.m. We invite everybody to come out and check out the work we're doing. They can see the boat uh, that has been built by our boat building students. They can check out the environmental restoration work that's being done by our environmental on water students and just learn, you know, meet the staff and really learn about our organization by coming there and seeing what's going on. Also, I would say for students who are interested, um, high school students as well as uh, rising ninth graders, uh, go online and, and learn about getting into our programs. Uh, you can actually contact Oria Freitas, is our social worker who's in charge of recruiting. And um, come on over and check out Rocking the Boat and see if you want to join up. All right, Chrissy Wood, Rocking the Boat. Thank you so much for coming Thank and sharing with us. And I hope things get back to normal real soon. Thanks so much. All righty, Chrissy Wood. Well, we got to take a quick break, but when we return, we will also hear from another organization looking to make New Yorkers' voices heard. We'll tell you about that when we return. Sir, are you okay? Everything's fine. Thanks. You wouldn't ignore this, so why ignore the signs of a stroke? Call 911 immediately, because time lost is brain lost. This is so cool, Dad. This is so cool, Dad. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of siblings in foster care who'll take you just as you are. Separate raw meats from other foods by using different cutting boards. 3,000 Americans will die from food poisoning this year. Keep your family safer. Check your steps at foodsafety.gov. G morning, sunshine. Wakey, wakey. You up? What'd you dream about? Me? JK. Text me back. I'll keep texting till you wake up. Are your parents home later? Is this something I did? Exclamation point. Huge fight right this now. isn't a joke. Hello? Text me. How are you? Hey, Mom. You know, girls, I used to cheer back in my day. Ready? Okay! Go team! That was amazing. 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 Mom, that was amazing. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of siblings in foster care who'll take you just as you are. In the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy, many New Yorkers were left without transportation for days. The Strap Hangers campaign is providing New Yorkers with an outlet to voice their concerns with the performance of the MTA during and after this natural disaster. We have now field organizer Jason Chinfault on the phone, and we welcome you now. Jason, Jason, good to have you. Hi, how are you doing this morning? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. So uh, make your voice heard. What, 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 are you, what are you feeling these days? Well, um, right now the MTA is conducting uh, public hearings on their fair height proposals, um, and we're actually collecting testimony from New Yorkers about the, the fair heights that they're experiencing. I know that you uh, just spoke about the, you know, the, the service during Sandy, and uh, folks are, you know, talking about the, the 
service and how they've been affected. Um, and I, I think last night I attended the, the Bronx hearing for the MTA fare increases. Um, and I, I actually saw a lot of residents coming out and thanking the MTA for getting the service back up um, as quickly as they did during the storm. Um, you know, it was a pretty, could have been or potentially could have been more catastrophic than it was had they not shut down the subways and actually got some of their equipment out of the way. Yeah, true indeed. I mean, there was a lot. There was a. I mean, to have a subway system shut down literally in New York City, one would never think that to be the case. But then that was the case with Sandy, and there was a quick response to getting things done. Given that, though, you still got New Yorkers who are on edge, get saying, "Listen, I don't want to pay anything more for another fare." It seems like every time we turn around, we're getting fare hikes, but yet and still the services still are questionable. Your thoughts? Well. Um our thoughts here at the campaign are that, you know, the, the governor showed great leadership during the, the, the crisis of Sandy, um, actually getting the system back in order, um, and that he needs to take some leadership in actually funding the MTA. I mean, the reason why we're at this position where the MTA has to propose fair increases is because the state has inadequately been able to sustainably fund uh, the system. Um, this is a system that moves about 8.5 million people a day, um, and we need to make sure that uh, this this uh, keeps going and that uh, transit's a viable option for people to take. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, just look at what happened during Sandy. The, the commutes when you shut down the system um, could be hours. I mean, two hours just to get inside and outside of Manhattan, um, folks taking uh, other modes of transportation. In an ideal situation, what would you like to see? Well, um, we saw that these fair proposals are kind of this uh, pick your poison, you know. Um, we can't really say that any of these are actually fair. I mean, people would be affected in different ways. There are four different proposals on the table. Um, so we've been collecting the comments of folks. And, you know, people, the riders in general are trying to protect what, what form of the fare they, they benefit from, whether it's the monthly unlimited metro card or they get the pay for ride bonus. Or Ideally, what we would see is some kind of structure uh, to, to fund the system that's sustainable. It's something that um, wouldn't, you wouldn't be burdensome heavily on the riders, as uh, the current fare structure is, um, for operations. Um, and the one idea that's been floating out there is the Sam Schwartz plan. Um, Sam Schwartz, Gridlock Sam, um, and his engineering firm has actually put together a plan that um, would help sustainably fund mass transit in New York City. Mm -hmm. When you look at uh, where we are right now, obviously you have, we have this system and it's a system that works. And of course, there's a lot of questions that still remain as to how to improve the system. You talked a little bit about how to improve the system. Yesterday, there was a hearing in the Bronx. You kind of alluded to that earlier. What were some of the things that we were hearing coming out of that hearing in the Bronx? Um, well, uh, I'll read you a couple of the comments that we got from some of the writers through our website. And, you know, uh, Maritza from the Bronx says that she's a single parent and she lives in a two-fare zone. Um, she has long waits for her buses and she's just wondering how, when the monthly metro card goes up, how she's going to be able to afford um, getting to work um, because, you know, the cost of living has gone up, but it's not reflected in her paycheck. Um, and then we have other folks who are just, you know, they're, they're, talking about the, the bonus that they get, and we have a lot of college students who can't afford a monthly metro card, um, and that benefit greatly from the bonus. So, you know, a mixed reaction from the folks out there. A lot of folks also have complaints about specific lines and specific routes that they take. Um, although the focus of the hearing was on the, on the fair, um, you know, folks still came up with the comments to express at MTA, and they had a couple of the managers, especially on bus operations there, um, that we're heeding the, the concerns of some of the folks in the crowd. Mm -hmm. How effective are these hearings when you when, when you hear the public actually come and, and raise their sentiments? How effective are they? Well, uh, I'll go back to the example of 2010 when they actually did the, some of the service cuts and they were talking about um, fare increases and uh, actually cuts to paratransit. And the paratransit community, community showed up in droves to the hearings, which actually, um, you know, kind of, but, well, I guess their, their voices were heard by the MTA board and they rescinded some of the cuts to paratransit. I mean, they were talking about cuts to paratransit that were going to leave folks a mile away, uh, mile away from their destination. Um, and accessoride is uh, greatly important for those who, the, the elderly and those who need medical services. 
So as you look forward, I mean, as we look forward in the future, are there other additional public hearings on the schedule now? Um, the last public hearing that they have on schedule is actually going to be this Thursday um, in Queens. Mm -hmm. um, and it's going to be in the Sheraton in Flushing. Um, it's an opportunity for anybody, even if you you live in the Bronx, to, to get out to, to this hearing and have your voice heard. Um, in, in the case that you cannot make it out to the hearing, we are submitting um, written testimony. So if you'd like to submit it to us electronically, you can go to our website at www.strathangers.org, um, and you'll see a button for the fair hike on our website. Um, and I'm happy to give you guys the website so you can post it up. You, you talked about that. We were just taking a look right there at the, at the uh, website and had a picture of the state of the subways. And uh, from your perspective, the state of the subways, how would you rate? Um, well, we can say that the, the subways are miles away from where they used to be, um, I, I guess, maybe 20 years ago. Maybe that doesn't really put it in perspective for folks. But, you know, I, I grew up in New York taking the subways and I see less graffiti, newer trains on the line countdown clocks telling me um, when the, the train's coming. Um, and, you know, I, I would say that it's miles away from where it used to be. Um, but at the, the same rate, we still need um, additional funding for the stations. I mean, we also put out a report on platforms um, and the conditions of platforms and looking at peeling paint and rusty walls and water dripping down and rats and stations. And, you know, all those things require a heavy lift of money um, to actually pay for this, and we're looking for leadership from the governor um, to provide us with that sustainable source of funding and funding them pay properly, so that way they can make those fixes. Um, specifically at the hearing last night, folks were complaining about water um, damage, you know, water dripping down from ceilings at 149th Street and Grand Concourse in that station, um, and asking why it can't look like 96th Street. Well, it definitely costs millions of dollars to actually fix those kinds of fixes, and yes, um, we are going to need those dollars to make the fixes. All right. Well, thank you so much for call, uh, spending some time with us, Jason. We'll continue to follow this, and definitely we have to have you back. Okay. Sounds great. All righty. Well, we got to take a quick break, but when we return, we're going to hear about one church. They're doing something to give back this Thanksgiving. But first, world-renowned French anthropologist Michael Agier paid a visit to Lehman College to discuss the rise in refugees. And Bronx Nets correspondent Arlene McCogo was there, and she has our report. As an acclaimed anthropologist known throughout the world, Professor Michael Agir, director of the Institute of Research and Development in Paris, France, spoke at a human rights class right here at Lehman College. Well, the, the, the main point is to, as a, is to um, make visible situations which are generally not uh, so visible, like the establishment of many camps and campments and um, transit centers and uh, where many people are living. And, uh, and that there is some public debate uh, about it. Yeah. His subject, refugees, now at an estimated 43.7 million worldwide, a figure studies say is at its highest in 15 years. These are people forcibly displaced by conflict and now living in temporary settings, many for years. Azir completed a seven-year study with his findings in his recently released book, Managing the Undesirables, where he argues they are consistently denied their basic rights with the laws of the land often not applying to them. Two books I have written about refugees. Refugees in the first book, which is called On the Margins of the World, and the, the second book, which is the result of this investigation on refugees camp, is called Managing the Undesirable, mm -hmm. both by Politi Press. Lehman College human rights professor Shishe Mibenga says exposing her students to Azir's work gives them an idea of the challenges before them. One of the core uh, objectives of my human rights class is to make our students at Lehman College realize that human rights at the heart of it is the individual. Yeah, the individual and the individual's basic needs. And we're looking not only at the individual, but the most vulnerable individual. So we're looking at the prisoner who's disenfranchised by his felon record. We're looking at the trafficked child. We're looking at the impoverished. We're looking at the refugee, the, indis the internally displaced person. 
Azure hopes his book gives readers an understanding of the problem, generates debate on how to better treat refugees, and ultimately is a foundation for the development of policy for a humanitarian government. In short, he wants to see refugees treated humanely and treated with care. This is among the first of many stops for Professor Ejer, who will be traveling around the country to share the results of his findings with the hopes of bringing positive changes to the lives of refugees. For Ronsnet, this is Arlene Makoko. And thank you, Arlene. Well, Thanksgiving is coming up, and many people right here in our own backyard are without basic needs. The Real Life Church will be holding their third annual Thanksgiving Day celebration which will offer a free dinner, clothing, and toiletries to those in need, letting the Bronx community know that God loves them and has a plan for everyone. Here now to tell us more about that is Pastor Reggie Stutzman. And Pastor, good to have you. Hey, good to be here. Good to, good to have you. So we're talking a little bit about Thanksgiving here. I, I guess, you know, there's a lot of people in need, given, given the fact that the hurricane and uh, Thanksgiving comes around, but it always brings to mind how blessed people are and how some people are just really are a little less fortunate. Yeah, this is our third uh, annual event, uh, and we do it at The Point, which is a community development center in Hunts Point. Uh, we've been able to feed over 1,200 people in the last two years. So mm -hmm. two years ago, we fed over 500. This last year, over 750 people. So the needs are definitely rising. Um, with the storm and everything, I don't know how many people we're going to feed. Um, like um, other, other um, parts of the show even talked about that the storm didn't really hit the Bronx too badly, but uh, there are people in need every day with or without a storm. So we want to um, help them, especially on Thanksgiving Day. Mm -hmm. So on that Thanksgiving Day, what can people expect? Well, there's um, free food that's given to us by the Bowery Mission downtown. It's a full turkey dinner uh, with, you know, all the, all the fixings, mm -hmm. uh, dessert, drinks. Uh, and then we have people that donate toiletries, personal hygiene items, soap, shampoo, uh, toothbrush, all that kind of stuff. And then we have a, a little clothing room that people can go in and shop and get free clothes, um, plus activities for the kids, crafts and face painting. And it's just, we have live music even. It's just a great day from... 11 a.m. to 4 o'clock at the point um, from our church. Mm -hmm. And for people who want to take part, because you can, you, other people can take part and be a volunteer in this. Yeah, yeah. We, you can visit our website, uh, reallifechurchnyc.com, and sign up. Just click on the Thanksgiving link, and that'll give you a registration form that you can sign up. Particular time you'd like to volunteer, uh, where from serving food to working in the clothing room, um, to even things that we need. We still need desserts, mm -hmm. cakes and pies and uh, personal hygiene items and clothes. So uh, a lot of people have given to people victimized by the storm. But again, if people have personal hygiene items or clothes to donate um, and desserts, I can't stress that even more because, uh, you know, any cakes or pies or anything, sodas, all of that we need so that we can help and bless people this Thanksgiving. So now the people that are coming to the point, where will they be coming from? They're going to come basically from Hunts Point, but it's open to anybody who doesn't have uh, Thanksgiving dinner or uh, just, you know, not able to, to, to provide for your family. Um, they're welcome to come and just have a, a full sit-down dinner. I don't believe in lines and I don't believe in numbers either. People are people. And so when they come in, they're going to be seated just like a restaurant and volunteers are going to serve them. Um, and there's going to be live music. It's just a wonderful experience. So it's open to anyone who's in need this Thanksgiving. What are you hoping that comes from this event? Well, number one is that people obviously see that there are people in Hunts Point that care. That's our church, real life church. We mm -hmm. care about people. Um, and that people, people see that, that there is, there is a church, um, you know, it's twofold. One is that we care for the needs and that people come to visit our church on Sunday mornings at 11 o'clock. So, uh, we don't have our own building yet. So we meet at the Hunts Point Rec Center, which is on Menida Street, but mm -hmm. join us at the point. Uh, it's 940 Garrison, uh, from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. And then come to church on Sunday morning at 11 o'clock at the Hunts Point Rec Center. Now, this isn't your first uh, community engagement because we just had you on not too long ago. Yeah. And you had another one. Tell, tell us about that and yeah. how, to go, how to turn out. It was incredible. We had our, our first of hopefully an annual medical optical outreach. Um, a ministry called Vision for Christ came from Texas. 
and one optometrist saw over 400 people and gave them free eye exams and free glasses and then those that they didn't have glasses for they're being made right now even and they'll be mm. shipped to me and then we'll contact people who were there to get them their free glasses plus we had um, nightly services every night uh, right on the street just shut the whole street down and just had a great time uh, so many people just walked away just just you know unbelievable that just so happy that they got the free ex exams and free glasses we ha had um, uh, free um, uh, diabetes testing and all of that it was just just an incredible three-day event so God's doing great things in Hunts Point what do you think of what do you think the message is that's getting out to people right now because as the season of Thanksgiving is coming you've got those that are you know really struggling and if you know Sandy hasn't affected you the economy might have affected you mm -hmm. what's the message that you're trying to send nowadays message is that no matter what happens in life God is still there and he cares about you um, and that that there are trials that we all face in life. Some are just completely disastrous. Others are just the mundane day-to-day -day stresses that we have, but, but God is constant. And I so appreciate that in my own life, that He's always there, He's always present. And no matter what storm we're facing, He's there to love us, to give us His grace, His mercy, and, and that we can know that we can make it through whatever storm we face. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for coming, Pastor Reggie Stutzman, and uh, best wishes to you on Thanksgiving. Thank and keep you up the good too. work. Thanks a lot. All righty, Pastor Reggie Stutzman. Well, we have to take a quick break, but guess what? We will return, and when we do, there'll be an inspiring musical story. You don't want to miss that. Stay with us. Here at Lehman College, Janal Shah, the Digital Strategy Director at J. Walter Thompson Company, is here to share her knowledge with students. Well, I've been telling my students that we're not here for just an intellectual exercise and at the end of their four years here they want to be pursuing a career and they want to know exactly what kinds of careers are out there not just in name but what do people do from the time they get into their office to the end of their day that results in them actually getting a paycheck at the end of the month and that is why I asked JWT to come. I wanted students to hear exactly what is the life of a marketer and I think we got that. I just hope what they end up taking away from this is that for the future jobs they don't need to be so anxious that a lot of it depends on themselves. There are ways to sort of go around any challenge that presents itself and I just hope that they walked away with some sort of understanding for advertising and marketing and hopefully maybe they even like it now. I think it was very informative, uh, found it very useful. Uh, I myself am into marketing too, I'm a business major and before this I really didn't know any popular companies that went into marketing but she really pointed out that it is important to advertise and not just for the company. And I've changed my path from journalism to social media to now being at an integrated ad agency and once you're out in the world you really realize that everything doesn't have to be so linear that you can take a zigzag road or you can try a few different things and it all just adds to your own work experience, your own personality, your own um, experience set. So I hope that they give themselves the credit and are brave enough to follow what they want to do. In all, Lehman College students were able to understand that their experience, skills and personal passion is exactly what it takes to further themselves in any career goal. Reporting for BronxNet, this is Neilani Rodriguez. I'm lucky. Let me help you with that. I get to do something I love. It has nothing to do with touchdowns or titles. Everybody bring it in. I get to play a part in the life of someone just starting out. How many of you think homework is just as important as teamwork? I help keep kids in school. Good. And that's the name of the game. My name is LaDainian Thomason. I don't just wear the shirt, I live it. Give, advocate, volunteer, live united. And welcome back. We thank Nialani for her story. Our next guest has used film to unfold the evolution of popular Garifuna music from Belize. The story explores the role of music and the musicians in the cultural renaissance of ethnic communities in Belize. Please welcome filmmaker of Punta Sol, Niasha Lang, and we thank you so much for coming and sharing with us. Thanks for having me. Good so, morning. Good morning. So give us a little bit about what you're doing here. All right. Well, it's uh, November, and November is the month in which Belizean Garifuna celebrate Settlement Day, 
mm -hmm. which is the day on which they arrived on the coast of Central America from after their long journey, um, they were <laughs> deported from the island of St. Vincent and were dispersed in Honduras, Belize, and Guatemala. Um, so November is just a time of celebration, and I'm happy to celebrate with the Garifuna community here in New York the music, the culture, the heritage of the Garifuna people. Mm. So as you celebrate, we're gonna, what, are we gonna, what are people going to be pleased to get a, your filmmaker? Well, I'm a filmmaker. This film is actually several years old. Um, it premiered at the Womex. Uh, Womex is the World Music Festival mm -hmm. in Europe. And what happened uh, and how it got there is that an artist from Belize named Andy Palacio won the Womex Award in 2007 for his um, album, Watina. I was making the film at the time about Garfield and music from Belize, including his music, mm -hmm. and uh, he was a big part of the film. Uh, he actually passed away uh, the following year. It was very sad for us, um, but I finished the film, and the following year that film was um, premiered at Womex. Mm -hmm. um, and so the film has been going since then. We've been trying to share it with the community and show a little bit about how the music has reached audiences outside of the communities where it comes from. For people who aren't familiar with Garifuna music, how would you describe it? Um, it's so rich and it's so, um, there are so many kinds. Uh, and as you may know, because we're in the Bronx, there are over 200,000 uh, Garifuna people living right here in New York City and over that many in Central America. So it's a rich, diverse culture. Um, the genre I focused on in the film was, is punta and punta rock. Punta rock is the popular version of punta, which is a rhythm that was played traditionally at funerals and wakes, um, also at weddings, strangely mm -hmm. enough. And it's kind of a, a mating dance um, music, uh, rhythm. Um, the way the older folks used to dance to it was uh, a very rhythmic and sensual, but very controlled and uh, graceful. Mm -hmm. The way the younger people started to dance to it, they sped up, they sped up the rhythm. And uh, it was a little more lewd, a little more loose. And that, that uh, more popular version became the Punta Rock. Mm -hmm. So as you went about making your movie, what were the things that you really were looking to bring home? I was really trying to show the connections, the way the, the traditional music had evolved in a way to then impact the broader communities and the connections between um, Garifuna music and other forms of music as well, um, other influences on the music, and in Belize in particular, how this music had impacted uh, other groups such as the Creole, mm -hmm. which, uh, you know, my family's uh, heritage is Creole, um, and we speak Creole or English not Garifuna, but despite the language barriers, this music was, uh, you know, something that just really took off in Creole communities as well. So for people who want to see the film, where they go? It's actually on the website, on my website, which is perennamedia.com. Mm -hmm. But um, again, it's November, and so there are a number of events, and uh, I'm always happy to make the film available to any, anybody who wants to screen it for, for a community event. Mm -hmm. um, it's also screened at several festivals, so people may see it on certain websites and um, through, the, through that information they can reach my website and contact me to get a copy of the film. Garifuna music on the rise? I think, yeah, I think that it's, uh, it's just, again, so rich and uh, there are so many musicians, so many talented Garifuna musicians out there who have very unique stories to tell and we know that um, musicians are, are even stronger when they have a story to tell. Mm -hmm. So I think it's only going, um, it's only going places. How long did it take you to get the film done? Wow, it took three years to finish mm -hmm. that film mm -hmm, from start to finish. Really? Mm -hmm. So walk us through what your process was in terms of getting the film done. Where'd you go? Who'd you see? Who'd you talk okay, to? Okay, right. Well, the first step was to actually figure out how to use a camera. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big step. <laughs> and after that, um, I began filming in New York because I was here at the time. And just uh, going underground, um, in a sense, there were a lot of uh, sort of basement parties and places where the music is, was heard and celebrated. And uh, I followed a couple of artists and then uh, got in touch with Andy Palacio, went down to Belize, spent a lot of time down there um, getting to know him and his story. And uh, again, traveled with uh, Andy Palacio and the Garifuna Collective to Europe, mm -hmm. where they won the Womex Award in Seville in 2007 and documented that. Uh, moment, you know, that sort of pinnacle of their success, um, and followed them back home to Belize and uh, finished the film up there. So the film is available on the website? It's available on the website, yeah. It's uh, 40 minutes, a short film. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, you know, at this point we're working on, uh, in, in collaboration with uh, an organization that I work with in Belize called the Global Parish Project, 
and some other organizations here in New York were working on other projects to further document the folklore of the Garifuna um, people. All right. Well, Niyasha Lang, thank you so much for coming and sharing thank with us. Thank you so much. Wishes, and uh, hopefully people will get a chance to check out that film. Thanks for having me. All righty. Well, Kes, stay with us because after the break, we're going to find out about an event that is designed to get a cure or to actually help to get a cure. We'll talk about that when we return right after this. Cook foods to the right temperature using a food thermometer. 3,000 Americans will die from food poisoning this year. Keep your family safer. Check your steps at foodsafety.gov. Dad, nice dad, nice dad. Charles! Nice dad. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of siblings in foster care who'll take you just as you are. I'm lucky. Let me help you with that. I get to do something I love. It has nothing to do with touchdowns or titles. Everybody bring it in. I get to play a part in the life of someone just starting out. How many of you think homework is just as important as teamwork? I help keep kids in school. Good. And that's the name of the game. My name is LaDainian Thomason. I don't just wear the shirt. I live it. Give. Advocate. Volunteer. Live United. Hey, how's it going? Sir, are you okay? What? Oh, this? It's probably nothing. I'm sure it'll go away. Go away? But, sir, that can't be good. No, it's cool. Really. Do you want a napkin or something? Everything's fine. Thanks. You wouldn't ignore this. So why ignore the signs of a stroke? At the first warning signs, call 911 immediately. Because time lost is brain lost. Well, two organizations are coming together for one good cause. The Cancer is a Reality Benefit taking place on Thursday, November the 15th. Sponsored by Crunch Time Fitness out in City Island and La Casa Grande in right here in the borough of the Bronx. Here with us now is Paulie Cigars de Silvio, uh, and also he's from La Casa Grande Cigars, and Anthony Chip Ciceri, uh Mama's Boys of the Bronx and owner of Crunch Time Fitness here in City Island. And gentlemen, welcome. What's up, bro? Is this Sports Center? I think I'm on the wrong. Uh... Yeah, and I'm Stuart Scott. <laughs> here you go, baby. <laughs> you guys are coming together for a good cause. That's right. So uh, talk to us about. The two of you guys come together and uh, y y you're working together to really bring awareness to this event. Well, Paulie's doing a Light 'em Up Fridays. Uh, My show Light 'em Up Fridays coming to BronxNet. The big thing was a, a, a reunion of such for all of us just to video people who have been on the show for his show, Mama's Boys of the Bronx. Italian, rea Italian reality stars. Italian mm -hmm. reality stars. <clears throat> and what happened was, unselfishly, he said, why don't we do something for a good cause? So we, we decided to do, uh, for the Italian, for the American Italian Foundation, ma mobile mammograms. Mm -hmm. I'm getting tongue tied here. Mobile mammograms. Mobile mammograms. Right. Try saying that twice, huh? There it's you like go. the hearings. What did you hear at the hearings? 
Mm. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. What time. hearing was that? The hearing. The, the, the hearing. Hear I can hear. Did you hear that? All right, Did sorry. you hear that? I heard it. Good. So tell us a little. So you got these two. So you, both of you guys are coming together. What's going to take place at the event? You got mm -hmm. mobile. Oh, uh, we got a bunch of um, B-list uh, reality stars. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you really mean C? Uh, you really or mean D? C, Claire. Yeah. Okay. No. We got a bunch of uh, reality stars coming. We got uh, Peter Judice, Teresa Judice's uh, brother-in-law. Mm -hmm. um, also, they're bringing the butler. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, um, yeah, a bunch of the mob wives are coming. Big Ange, Carla, uh, Chicago mob wives, Leah D. Simone, and Nora. Um, you're going to have me, of course, with my co-stars from Mama's Boys of the Bronx, Giovanni, Frankie, uh, maybe a couple of the other guys will come down. My mother, his aunt, their <laughs> grandmother, and their sister. Um, got the <clears throat> who else? His mother and my mother. Well, both mothers, they went to different schools together. Right. Uh, so they'll be meeting up again for the first time. See. Um, <laughs> a whole bunch of uh, stars are going to be down there. A couple of the, uh, who else, the car fellas, you said, right? Yeah, someone gets out of line, they're going to see stars. <laughs> see? So you guys, so you guys are really going to be putting it on down there. They're uh, coming to show crazy. support and love for us. I mean, they really... We're going to be rolling out the pink carpet. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. not a red carpet, it's a pink carpet. And we're going to be um, walking down the pink carpet and having a good time. It's going to mm -hmm. be an event. Um, anybody could come out. I hope the whole Bronx comes out to support. Um, Good idea by Chippy. I'm glad he came up with it, and it turned our lives upside down. But for a while, but it's for a good cause. And I bet you Friday, the day after, we're going to be, you know, just feeling good, very good about ourselves. A lot, uh, Stuart. A lot of our um, people that we know have died and passed away from breast cancer. Mm. So you know, this this holds dear to our hearts because we we've been affected by it personally. Right. You know, uh, our good friend Giovanni, his mother and father have died from cancer. You know, a lot of people that we know, our mother's friends and, you know, have died from breast cancer. So we think it's a, a worthy cause to bring this out and try to help, you know, them search, you know, find a c cure, of course, by raising some money, mm. you know, through the, uh, you know. And so we've got our friend here. Call. And, uh, you do with you deal with hand rolled cigars? Yes, we do hand rolled cigars all day, every day in the Arthur Avenue market. It's fresh. You come there, you see these guys rolling, and um, Melvy's there. He's one of the uh, cigar rollers that are there, and he's going to be there. We're going to have five, six cigar rollers just going off that night, just banging out cigars. We're going to have DJ Surge on the ones and twos. G Fellow is going to perform, Italian hip hop artist. His show's coming out on Fuse. This is a reality show. It's coming out on Fuse in January, I think. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be, and he's emceeing the, the whole thing. And we're going to be doing Light on Fridays all night. We're going to be videotaping, live stream. But come see it in person. It's much more fun. Give your donations. And you could check us out on Facebook, Cancer's Reality Event, to give a donation. Mm -hmm. we got a big response. This is the best nation in the world is donations. That's right. And, and the thing about it is you are looking for the public to really just come on out and be oh, a part of Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not you know. our event. It's an event for cancer and it's not a party for us we're there to, we're gonna have fun we're gonna have a lot of we're gonna we're gonna cry we're gonna laugh we're gonna hug you know because that's what comes out in events like this people are gonna speak Leah D. Simone who's on the Chicago Mob Wives mm -hmm. she's coming in she's probably landing right now and she's actually gonna be you know her mom is is, is fighting this breast cancer as we speak mm -hmm. so that lies near and dear to her heart G fellow's mom passed of cancer so he's going to do a song, uh, you know, specifically for her. It affects I mean, everybody. It affects everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, well, guys, we want to thank you for coming and sharing with us. Of course, you can find out more about this event. It's there. Again, it's tomorrow, taking place Thursday, November 15th. Tell them where to go. The Arthur Avenue Retail Market and Little Italy of the Bronx, the real Little Italy of New York. All right, real Little Italy. Why don't you come on out there? Now, before we do close the show, thank you, gentlemen, for coming and sharing thank with you. us. Thank you. Now, before we close the show, I do want to take a moment to announce that a very important member of the Bronx community has passed away. Chairperson of the Bronx Community Council Board Number 11, Dominic Astori, served the Bronx community for a combined total of about 25 years. And uh, he'll be greatly missed throughout the Bronx and beyond. Now, if you want to pay your respects, the wake will be held at John Dormy and Sons on Morris Park Avenue. Uh, that's going to take place Wednesday and Thursday from 2 to 4 and from 7 to 9. The funeral, uh, Friday at St. Clair of the CC Church on Paulding Avenue at 9.45 a.m. and certainly Certainly, our thoughts and prayers go out to his family. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today's show. I want to thank you, the guests, for joining us and uh, also the viewers for tuning in. And, uh, if you want, you can tune in tonight for the Recablecast, 10 p.m., Channel 67, Verizon Files, Channel 33, Channel 33, I should say, past, present episodes available online. We encourage you always have an amazing week. Stay safe. Don't forget, keep your heart, your mind, but most of all, this channel Wide open, Darren Jaime, a.k.a. Stuart Scott for the rest of this segment, signing off. Take care.